Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to our Ask the Expert event. Uh, very happy this, this Friday to have uh, for our Ask the Expert event, David Allen Sibley. We're going to be talking about the summer of birds, and there's really no one uh, that you would want to talk to more about birds with than, uh, than David Allen Sibley. My name is Arun Roth. Uh, you might know me from All Things Considered on GBH. Uh, I also host In It Together and the uh, Consider This podcast with GBH and, uh, and NPR and various other things on public TV. So I might be a familiar face or voice. Um, very happy to have you with us. I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us. I, I especially want to thank uh, our, the members of the Leadership Circle and the RLS members who, who are joining us today. We, we really appreciate your continued support. And, and for that reason, it's really great to have you with us for this today. Um, there are Many of you here, people are, are adding in. I, I, I can see uh, the, the, the numbers ticking up. Hundreds of you uh, of you now, and you're going to have some some great questions. So, I'll start off with uh, talking through how this is going to work. Uh, the most important thing, a friendly reminder, is that uh, we will be on video, David and I, but you will not. But this is Ask the Expert, and your participation in this is vital. We want your questions. The way you do that is if you check out how the, screen, the Zoom screen operates, look down and you can see uh, there's a Q&A tab down at the bottom of your screen. Open up that Q&A tab, click on it, and just type your question directly in there. Uh, Think of it sort of as, as a radio show. We want to know where who you are and, and, and where you're calling from, or in this case, where, where you're watching us. So uh, please put your name, and uh, first name is fine, uh, and, and where, you, uh, where you are, where, where, you're, where you're watching this. And uh, something else to note is that uh, you will see every, other questions that come up. If you go into the Q&A and someone has already asked your question, uh, put a thumbs up next to it. The thumbs up will, will, will accrue, and that way, uh, if say a question gets uh, a lot of votes, a lot of thumbs up, it'll go to the top of my prompter here, and I'll know that a lot of people want this question asked, and I'll make sure that we'll ask that uh, up next. One other little thing, although this is this is uh, very cool, there's now a transcript, uh, a closed captioning feature. Uh, if you go take a look at the bottom of your screen, uh, you can click the live transcript button. Uh, there are two transcription options available. Uh, we recommend you uh, select subtitle. That will enable captioning at the bottom of, of your screen. You can also select the option of full transcript, uh, and that gives you a sidebar window uh, on, on the side of your screen where you can uh, see where things are, are being said uh, by, by the individual speaker. Uh, and uh, with that, um, oh, and the captions might be slightly delayed, but Looking at how it's working right now, I think uh, I think we're we're pretty good. It's pretty great technology. Uh, so with that, let me uh, introduce David Allen Sibley, uh, who I mean, if if you're here for this event, he he needs uh, pretty much no introduction. Uh, there there is no greater expert on birds, no one I would rather talk about birds with than, than David Allen Sibley. Uh, you know him from the successful uh, guides that that are just. Uh, foundational works at this point, the studies that, that, that bear his name, the Sibley Guide to Birds, the Sibley Guide to Bird Life and, and Behavior, uh, the Guide to, uh, to, to Birding, uh, Eastern and Western US. Uh, he, he's, he's covered it all. Uh, he's, you can read him in the Smithsonian Science, Wilson Journal of Ornithology, Birding, Birdwatching, North American Birds, the New York Times. Uh, yeah, I, 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 we, can, we can go uh, on and on. Let me mention also, the, the Linnean Society of New York's Eisman Medal, uh, winner of that, the Roger Tory Peterson Award for Lifetime Achievement from the American Birding Association. Uh, his latest book is What It's Like to Be a Bird, and it's another wonderful book. Uh, David Allen Sibley, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. It's good to, uh, good to speak with you again. Hi, Arun. Yeah, it's great to be back. Thank you. So a reminder, again, get your questions. I don't need to remind you because we already have uh, around uh, 80 questions. So I'm going to scroll <laughs> to the top of that. I'm going to start it off with, uh, with, with one of my own. And uh, then I think David will probably get to questions from the audience pretty quickly because that, that's what they came for. But um, something that, that really is, is at the top of, of my mind right now, right, right today in, in, in the news, is uh, we've been hearing about um, this concern with uh, bird sicknesses uh, that seem to be associated with, uh, with feeders. This has been happening in the southeastern United States 
but have heard about this, uh, actually heard from the Connecticut Audubon, which also raises this as a concern that, that um, this is something that we should start to think about right now, a little bit farther up the, uh, the East Coast, lest this come our way. Uh, and if you could just start off by telling us what, 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 what this is going, what, what this disease is that, that, that is that is happening and what we know about it and as birders and bird lovers, what we should know. Yeah, well, that's definitely the, the news of the day in the bird world that um, it's just really breaking news. So um, um, I mean, what I know about it is what I've read over the last few days and weeks, um, but it's, um, uh, it's a disease that was first noticed in the spring in the, around the DC area. And since then has spread or, or what seems to be the same condition has spread to many states, mostly south, um, southeast and Midwest, west to Indiana, at least. Um, and quite a few in Pennsylvania um, more recently. Um, it's, it involves um, conjunctivitis, uh, crusty eyes, and also some neurological symptoms like birds that just sit still and have some tremors or um, shaking their head, things like that. That uh, seemed to affect mostly young birds, just recently fledged. Um, and a lot of common backyard birds like robins and starlings and grackles. And, um, but of course, those are the species that are most conspicuous that um, you know, you're more likely to see a, a sick individual of one of those species because they, they spend a lot of time in backyards around houses. Um, but anyway, that's the sort of the spread of it and all the tests, as far as I know, all of the testing that's been done so far has come up negative. So it's not, um, it's not the typical conjunctivitis. It's not um, uh, any of the, it's not West Nile or avian influenza or in any of the, they tested immediately for the diseases that are known that, that can be um, communicated to people. Um, so it's still a complete unknown and it's possible it's more than one condition. Um, it's possible that it's not a disease at all, but some environmental um, uh, contaminant or some other uh, issue. Um, it's still a big mystery. Um, so the I know that Connecticut a few days ago, and then just in the last two days, Rhode Island and Massachusetts both started recommending that people take down bird feeders. And this is, it's really, it's essentially social distancing for birds. Um, the idea is to, if the disease is coming this way, or if, the, if this, this issue is coming this way, um, that um, keeping as much space between birds as possible um, and, and not creating an attractive nuisance like a bird feeder where a lot of individuals gather in close proximity would help to keep it from spreading. So it's a real preemptive abundance of caution kind of move, but taking down bird feeders will presumably help stop the spread. Wow. I mean, I, I think about the, the, the scene that I have just uh, just right outside my, my window here. We, we've, we've got a couple of feeders and it's quite a scene in the summertime. There, there are multiple species. They, they're they mm -hmm. mostly getting along. Um, yeah. They bring their fledglings, uh, you know, to the feeders. To yeah. feed. And it sounds like that is exactly what we we got to stop. Yeah. And the, um, I mean, the good news is that this time of year, there is so much natural food out there that um, bird feeders aren't really necessary. And there's a couple of studies and a study that just came out very recently, an, a new study that shows again that um, birds don't rely on bird feeders at all. The bird feeders make almost no difference in the bird's overall survival. And um, they're always getting just a small part of their daily intake from the feeders. They're, they're always even though you might see house finches and chickadees and other things just sitting on your feeders all day, it's probably different individuals coming and going. And those birds are still getting at least half of their food from the wild. So taking down your bird feeders, you don't have to feel bad about it. Um, 
I mean, you'll miss the birds, um, miss seeing them, but they won't, there will be no, uh, no hardship, no ill effects for the, the birds not having access to the feeders anymore. So if you're going to take down your bird feeders for a few weeks, this is probably the best time of year to do it. Um, because there's so much natural food out there right now. Good to know. And, and actually, uh, as, as soon as we're done here, that's, that's the first thing I'm, I'm going to be doing. Uh, a little bit sad about it, but it's not like they'll be going away. Uh, let me ask you, what about uh, what about baths, uh, though? Because I'm, I'm just thinking that uh, this summer in particular, I, I've, I've been putting out water pretty pretty regularly. Is they're all drinking from the same source? Is, is, oh, that, is that good? Yeah, that's that's a part. Yeah, that's also included in the recommendation that that uh, bird baths, water features, those kinds of things um, should also be uh, avoided. And it's as far as I know, it's still. Like I said, it's very preemptive. I don't think there have been any reports of this condition north of New Jersey yet, um, but uh, hoping to limit the spread. Um, and um, it's an open-ended recommendation, so I'm not sure when, when it would be lifted. Um, but presumably in a few weeks, if we find out that there, uh, you know, wh whatever news is coming out about the the condition spreading or not. Um, uh, it, there's some evidence that it's already uh, diminishing. Um, there are fewer cases being reported um, in in the south where it's uh, where it was common. So it might already be diminishing. Um, I should say there was some, it, it overlaps um, quite a bit with the, the emergence of the 17 year cicadas that came out this year that were a big news story around DC and other spots. Um, and uh, so there was some thought that it might be linked in some way to the emergence of the cicadas. Um, but uh, apparently the people who are studying this, this condition say that it, it doesn't, <laughs> superficially it looks like it might match up, but it really doesn't. Um, they, they don't think it's linked to the cicadas. Um, and that was actually, uh, that was my first question out of the gate, but there was also a lot of people also would ask that, that same question. So it was nice. We, we got that uh, right away. Uh, let me get to our, uh, some of these uh, questions. We have a lot of them. Uh, Penny is asking, and uh, several other, more than a dozen other people want to know this as well, um, asking if you've seen a change in migration due to, uh, due to uh, climate change. Uh, yes. Um, with a qualifier, it's always with birds. Anything, it's it's difficult to um, point to climate change definitively as the reason for a, a change. But um, in my lifetime, I've I grew up in Connecticut, and now I live in Massachusetts. I've moved around a lot, but but this no, southern New England has really been my my long term home, and. Um, in the 50 years that I've been birding in this region, there have been really big changes. Um, one that right at the top of the list is the increase in species like red-bellied woodpecker. Um, I remember as a kid in Connecticut and in the early 1970s, we actually drove 20 miles to see a red-bellied woodpecker that had shown up at someone's bird feeder. And now it's one of the most common backyard birds through the the entire state of Connecticut, as well as Massachusetts. And it, it's a Southern species that in the 1970s, it was just reaching the coast of Connecticut from the South. Um, and a really exciting occurrence when the, that one showed up in East Haven in like 1972. And uh, big, there were a, a dozen people gathered to see it when we went to look. And now it's they're, they're everywhere. And that's um, presumably the warming, warming climate is playing a part in the spread of that species. So a lot of other species like cardinal tufted titmouse, um, mockingbird, um, black vulture is also expanding to the north. And when researchers look at across all species, essentially almost every species is doing well at the northern edge of its range and not so well at the southern edge, which is just a, it's a, the whole thing is, the whole system is shifting to the north as, and that's presumably linked to warming temperatures. 
Um, a lot of species migrate. They stay later in the fall and they arrive earlier in the spring. Things like Eastern Phoebe was incredibly rare in the winter in the 1970s, but now in Connecticut on the Christmas bird counts in December and early January, there are quite a few Eastern Phoebes that are found. Um, so a lot of things like that. And like I said, it's with things like red-bellied woodpecker, you can point to just the, the suburbanization of the habitat, the, the growth of, of sort of suburban neighborhoods with lots of trees, lots of bird feeders, lots of little microclimate warm spots around the houses, around hedges. All that makes it easier for th a species like red-bellied woodpecker to survive this far north. Um, so it's probably a combination, but, but yes, to answer that, the initial question, absolutely. I, I think I see signs of um, southern species moving north and the, the, the warm season being extended on earlier and later. Um, so um, the timing of migration has, has shifted a bit. Um, yeah, and I expect we'll see a lot more. Birds are really adaptable, so they're, and they, they adjust quickly to these changes. Um, uh, Chris from West Hartford specifically asks, uh, he says that there seems to be, seem to be a dearth of warblers this spring from in the Northeast. Uh, is, is that something you've heard or noticed or thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, that's another one that it's so hard to get a really good overview of what is, uh, you know, the whole population of a species are, and the, especially the migration that we see here in the Northeast is very weather dependent. So if the weather conditions are right, you'll get a fallout. You get a huge number of birds that all stop their migration in the same area on the same day. And you can walk around and see hundreds sometimes of warblers and migrating birds. Um, and if the weather conditions don't quite come together to produce a fallout like that, or if the fallouts happen on weekdays when fewer birders are out, um, the impression of the migration is going to be uh, less, less positive, less impressive than usual. So it's always hard to say, or it's, um, I wouldn't read too much into one migration season. Um, there's a better, um, a really good long term data set called the Breeding Bird Survey that. Um, Volunteers go out and, and survey a set route um, around the same date every year. And it's looking specifically for nesting birds. Um, and that produces a, a real long-term consistent data set. And, and that for warblers in the Northeast, it shows a lot of species declining, a few species increasing. It's a, it's a mixed bag, but um, back to the climate change question, a lot of the, the species at the southern edge of their range, like say Magnolia warbler in, in southern New England, which is right at the southern edge of its breeding range, they're, they're disappearing. They're, or they're, we're at the, the southern outposts, they're, they're not nesting here anymore, they're moving north. Um, so anyway, it's, um, uh, I, when I think back to the migrations that I saw when I was a kid in the 1970s in Connecticut, um, it's, I don't think I see the same numbers now, um, but again, it's hard to, you know, my, my memory of sort of the, <laughs> the magic of migration when I was a teenager and the amazing fallouts, I might be sort of conflating one or two big events and, and expanding that to an impression of the good old days. Um, uh, so there's, there's quite a bit of evidence that, that bird populations in general are declining, but I wouldn't, a lot of species are increasing at the same time, and I wouldn't read too much into one, your experience in one migration season. Uh, the fascinating question that kind of gets to all, all this, this is from uh, Don in, in Pittsfield. Uh, he has uh, given the, the huge decrease in North American birds, have you considered revising your field guides to include information about habitat and the status, possible reasons for decreases, and connecting that with maps and information on the migratory destinations of each species. It's sort of everything we're talking about here, a new book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's, um, 
I'm I'm constantly working on on updates and and new information and and my app, which is the the bird guide as an app, that it's easy to update that. Um, so I've been making some changes in that, and I've just actually just in the last few days, coincidentally, been working on gathering together some of this conservation information, the the population trends that are shown by the breeding bird surveys. Um, and some other information and trying to incorporate that into the app. Um, but um, it, it does, it gets back to the, the same point in a way that essentially every, in, every species has its own story. Um, they have a specific summer habitat, a specific winter habitat, specific needs on migration, different migration routes. Um, different migration timing, they're all affected slightly differently by um, what's going on with land use or climate change or availability of food. Um, so each species um, and each region, each state um, is kind of its own specific story. And it's very difficult to summarize that effectively and um, but uh, it is really it's it's really important information and I am I'm working on just the beginning of trying to get some of the most basic information out there of which species are declining or increasing overall and and like I said it's not a it's not a doom and gloom not a total doom and gloom picture many species are declining but many other species are increasing and um, it's going to be a mixed bag. Interesting. Um, we have a, a question. Um, I believe it is from uh, Sarah or Herb Sarah. Um, and I'm curious about this as well, because you and I talked about this very briefly the, the other day, asking if you're in favor of renaming birds named after humans or those or humans who are associated with the racist or, or complicated history. Um, and uh, just curious for, for your thoughts on that. And and thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, I and some people, some viewers might know that I, I was involved a couple of months ago in a panel discussion that was looking at this issue. And um, and I am in favor of, of changing names of the birds that are named for people. It's, um, uh, I think part of the, the, the impetus for the movement was to um, to remove these names that are there's essentially monuments to early 1800s um, uh, naturalists, um, which is all essentially all white men. Although a lot of the the people who are honored in the names of birds were not naturalists, but friends of naturalists or or patrons of naturalists. Or it's um. There's one one example in particular. The uh, Scots Oriole is a southwestern U.S. northern Mexican species, and it, so it's named for a, a Mr. Scott, who was an army officer in the early mid 1800s. Um, as far as anyone can tell, he had no interest in birds and never even acknowledged the fact that a bird had been named for him. <laughs> uh, the bird was named by another army uh, um, a military officer who was a naturalist um, and but he didn't explain why he named it for for Scott um, so it's things like that and it's when you start looking into the the history um, a lot of those naturalists at the time were were pursuing um, the um, uh, research into um, like measuring skulls of humans to prove <laughs> prove the superiority of the white race. Um, Scott, who was honored in the name of Scott's Oriole, was uh, a lot of what the army did then was moving Native Americans, um, pushing Native Americans out of their their own lands and into reservations. And he he actually led the um, forced removal of the Cherokee from Georgia to Oklahoma. Um, so it's some pretty troubled history. And even the ones who don't have any specific um, 
issues like that in their in their history. Um, every everyone, all of these white men who were naturalists, were totally supported by the the system at the time of slavery and and women um, being relegated to um, just supporting uh, really inferior roles. So it. Um, for me, as soon as I started learning about the history of these birds, it, it becomes a little uncomfortable or the, the people behind the birds. And, and then you start to think, why should a bird even have to carry that baggage? Why should the bird be a monument to this person <laughs> who, who um, you know, some of them were questionable, some were not, but you can't, we can't go back now and, and make a distinction between who, who deserves a bird name and who doesn't. Um, I think it's just, it makes sense to just name all the birds for the birds. Um, and most of them, when you look into it a little bit, most of them have names that they went by for some period of time or in some books that that refer specifically to the bird. So um, uh, it won't be hard to find uh, names that have already been in use um, to uh, rename a lot of these species. So, so yes, I am in favor of it. And it's, um, uh, I think it, it, it's, it will help also to make birding more inclusive. Um, I think that the, having all of these birds named for people who really celebrate the the white European conquest of the new world um, and and uh, the system of slavery that that made it all possible um, and the the uh, uh, persecution of Native Americans all of that is part of it and and um, so removing those names that link back to all of that will just um, make it easier to talk about birds with anyone that you uh, that you come across. And now that I know the history, you know, if I was birding in in the Southwest and met a Native American and mentioned that I had seen a Scots Oriole, I would be pretty I would feel pretty awkward about saying. Mm. I, I just saw a Scots Oriole. It, it's just, um, it, I'd be a lot more comfortable uh, using a different name for that bird. So uh, that's that's my my view on that. You, you mentioned uh, inclusivity and, and birding, and I wonder if you could just talk about that a, a, just a, a bit more, how much of that is uh, an issue. I, I'd never really thought about it until uh, I, I was uh, speaking, actually interviewed an African-American birder and, and talked about uh, how it can be tricky um, being out with your binoculars if you're African American in certain neighborhoods, <laughs> and I've yeah. never, never even occurred to me before uh, that yeah. those kind of things come up. Yeah, you know that, and and I never really appreciated that until recently. The there's um, there's been a um, event called Black Birders Week that happened this year and last year. Um, and that grew out of uh, the Christian Cooper event in um, Central Park where Christian Cooper, a black birder was um, accosted by a white woman um, when he, he asked her to leash her dog. Everyone's probably familiar with the story, but anyway, it just brought, really brought out the point that, that um, African Americans who are out doing normal things like bird watching are um, uh, viewed with suspicion. Um, and I grew up, you know, I grew up bird watching, and we used to go, you know, we'd go out at three o'clock in the morning to look for owls and just sort of wander around neighborhoods in Connecticut. Um, and a few times the police would show up and, and ask what we were doing. And we'd just say, yeah, hi, we're looking for owls. And, and they'd say, okay, have a good time. And it, it um, I realize now what a privilege that was. And um, that, 
you know, so much of uh, something like birding, uh, being a naturalist, it, it, a lot of us point to a mentor. Um, and I, you know, I realized someone pointed out to me a few years ago that um, mentors, it's um, the whole system sort of favors white men that they're, um, you know, a, a 12 year old boy can be sort of um, mentored by a, a 50 year old, 60 year old man and, you know, go out on birding trips, um, go out for the day. A 12 year old girl, it's not, it's a very different thing. And, and um, minority communities, Black, Hispanic, um, they, there are very few naturalists in that community and it's very difficult to uh, get access to a mentor outside of that community. So it, the whole thing is, is set up for, um, to be easier for white men to develop an interest and to, to just pursue an interest in, in nature. Um, and that it's a huge issue, I think, because it's not, there's nothing particularly white about nature study. It's not a cultural thing. Everybody, we all feel this connection to nature and, and it's, it's good. Psychologically, there are all kinds of benefits to being out in nature and, and uh, just being connected to that. And it has nothing to do with, with our community. It's just, uh, it's a human thing. Um, so I've, I think it's really important to find ways to bring that experience to, uh, to everyone, to give equal access. Um, and it certainly has not been equal access. Let me ask a, a very specific bird question uh, here, and then we want to get to um, something that our, our colleague Jamie is, is going to uh, bring up. Uh, but this has been upvoted by, by a number of people. So um, uh, Jill asks, uh, what is the best way to quickly identify a Cooper's hawk and to distinguish a Cooper's hawk from a sharp-skinned hawk? <laughs> uh, <laughs> getting into the nitty gritty now. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Cooper's hawk and sharp shinned hawk, they're so similar and they're, um, uh, it's a perennial problem. And I think they're, they're <laughs> then, you know, at these hawk watching sites, they're places where, where real experts um, sit out for several months in the fall, spring or fall, watching migrating hawks and counting and identifying all the hawks. And, and distinguishing coopers and sharp shinned hawk is a constant source of trouble. And uh, a couple of studies um, found that there's, even the experts make a lot of mistakes. Um, they are just really tricky to tell apart. Um, so, it, the, the best way to distinguish them depends on whether they're perched or flying, um, adult or immature. You need to look at different things. Um, and a lot of it even then comes down to experience and because uh, the differences are kind of subjective and um, subtle. So if it's perched, I would look at the the size and shape of the head relative to the body. Cooper's hawks look sort of long necked, big headed. The head's a little bit square. Um, uh, and like I said, all that's all subjective and subtle and, <laughs> and it needs some experience to be able to judge it correctly. Um, I will say um, this time of year, summer in Southern New England, um, you're very unlikely to see a sharp shinned hawk. Um, Cooper's hawk has increased a lot in the last um, 50 years. Um, and they have become the, the default nesting exhibitor across all of Southern New England. Um, and that includes, I would 
also include New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, you're unlikely to see a sharp shinhawk in the summer unless you're up north in the in sort of mixed woods, spruce woods, then you start to get into some sharp shinned hawks and fewer Cooper's hawks. But um, so uh, in the summer in Southern New England, it's, it's almost certainly a Cooper's hawk. Um, migration and winter, it's a, it's a toss up, but, but still in the winter more recently, in recent years, Cooper's hawk in, in Massachusetts, Connecticut has been much more frequent than sharp shinned. Um, uh, but it really, um, uh, you know, I, it's hard to give you a, a simple, a simple answer. I look at head shape, head size on immatures, look at the pattern of streaking on the underparts. Cooper's is pretty much immature. Cooper's is kind of white with very fine, distinct, um, simple, neat streaks and sharp shinned has more um, mixed barring, checkering, um, blotchy streaks. Um, on adults, but it, look at but it's not always going to be easy. No, no, it's details. <laughs> it's details and and subjective. So, yeah. Um, sorry, maybe that's a maybe that's a good enough answer that there isn't an easy way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, and a, don't trust pictures that you see online because a, a very high percentage of photos that you find online are misidentified. So, good to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, Great good questions. We're, we're going to get to more uh, of, our, of our questions for, from our audience. But I, I want to uh, hand over now to uh, our, our colleague, uh, Jamie. Hey, Jamie. Hi, Arun. Hi, David. Hi. And hello, uh, everybody at home. Thanks so much for spending some time with us while we ask expert David Sibley your questions about birds. So whether convening virtually, online, or via broadcast, GBH programs and events offer topics that engage, enlighten, and inspire. If you enjoyed today's event, then please consider making a donation so we may continue providing free events to the community. If you are a fan of birds, we have some great thank you gift options if you decide to make a donation to GBH today. First off, if you are able to give $7.50 a month as a GBH sustainer, which translates to $90 a year, you will receive a signed copy of David Sibley's beautiful hardcover book, What It's Like to Be a Bird, pictured behind me on my left. It's wonderful. I enjoy going through it and looking at all his amazing, amazing artwork. Uh, and I imagine we do have a lot of David Sibley fans joining us today who may have this book already. And if that's the case, we have another option for you. If you donate $6.25 per month as a GBH sustainer or $75 a year, we would be happy to send you this light blue uh, t-shirt pictured behind me on my right, which features uh, a great blue heron, which was actually um, designed by David Sibley himself. So you can either get a book full of beautiful illustrations by Mr. Sibley, or you can get the t-shirt behind me uh, featuring a great blue heron. Um, and it's unisex and comes in sizes small through 2XL. So there's something for everyone. So how do you make a donation and get these great gifts? Just visit wgbh.org slash support events to make a donation in any amount. Every dollar donors give enables GBH to continue producing great virtual events like this one year round on a wide range of topics from birding to storytelling to baking and so much more. But it's all made possible because of audience support. So simply click on the support link you see in the chat tab now, or you can text GBH, so that's without the W, just GBH to 800-204-3811. That's 800-204-3811. 3811 to make a donation. Donations from GBH viewers, listeners, and virtual event guests like you at home help new programs take flight. If you're already a GBH donor, thank you so much for your support. And to everybody joining us today, may birds continue to bring you joy, inspiration, and hope this summer and always.
Back to you, Arun and David. Thank you. And um, yeah, that the, the the book is uh, is wonderful, um, and that, that that shirt looks uh, pretty fantastic as, as well. D David, um, many years ago, this was uh, in in my college years. A, a good friend of mine uh, got a tattoo of, of the great blue heron. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure the book that he took with him to the artist was uh, Birds of the Eastern. It was your, it was your, uh, <laughs> your, your art. I don't nice. know if you got any royalties from that. <laughs> I haven't seen any. <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> but uh, it was a. Uh, I would add that the uh, the T-shirt is printed by Liberty Graphics in Maine, which many viewers probably know is the, they've been around for decades and really a leader in nature themed t-shirts. It's all eco-friendly printing and they do a really fantastic job with it. So so just so people know, it is a Liberty Graphics t-shirt. So they'll know it's a high quality shirt. Thank awesome. you for adding that in. That those are important details too. Great, uh, great stuff. Um, so uh, we'll get back into our, our questions now. Um, well, David, actually, let me, I want to ask you, a, a, here's a question in mind, which might actually be in, in the mix, but we were talking about uh, just before this, the, how difficult it is to distinguish two different species of, 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 of hawks. Uh, one thing um, that, that uh, I, I've been, because um, I'm, I'm very much a, a backyard birder. Like, I, I know individual birds uh, mm -hmm. to degrees. And uh, I was wondering if there are any tips for, um, Say, I know like with blue jays, uh, one of the ways I tell my individual blue jay friends apart is their sideburns are distinctive. Some, some of them connect all the way, some of them zigzag, and each mm. one, it's like a fingerprint. That's the only one I know though. Like robins, I, I can't tell a robin apart from a robin. Are, are, there, are there other tricks for individual birds to, to tell individual individuals apart? Yeah, and um, you know, I, I haven't really, um, done very much of that. Once in a while at, at my own feeders in my backyard, I'll see one, one individual bird that really stands out. It's got you know a couple of white feathers somewhere or something that really makes it distinctive. But um, yeah, I suspect that um, at least when you're dealing with a relatively small number of birds, um, that you could identify almost any species by the details of pattern like that. So the same way you're you're doing the blue chase by the the shapes of the markings around the, the head and neck. Um, um, American Robin, there's a lot of variation in the the details of the white markings around the eyes and uh, how much black there is on the head. Males have more black than females. Um, so I think probably the you know the same way the researchers identify individual humpback whales, <laughs> you could start keeping a record of the the details of exactly how the the pattern of white markings around the eyes of a robin or the um, uh, you know if you've got house finches, um, how much red there is on the males, how bright the red is, and those things like that they they don't change. Um, Birds like that, they, they molt their feathers once a year. So um, they, uh, they'll keep the same pattern pretty much, the same, the same feathers colored the same way for a full year. And, and in most cases, when that's been studied, they find that, that the new feathers that grow in come in exactly the same as the feathers before. Um, so once you discover something like that, that works to identify an individual bird, um, it'll probably continue to work for, for that bird's entire life. Hmm. But like I said, it's gonna be tricky to keep track of more than a few, <laughs> a few individuals. Um, yeah. um, question from uh, uh, Allison uh, and uh, uploaded as well. And it's also something I, I've, I've encountered uh, in, in different ways. Uh, they're asking, uh, uh, their parents' yard has a lot of sparrows that seem a lot of sparrows that seem to be taking over and aggressively pushing out smaller wrens from birdhouses. Uh, any recommendations for that? And I, I know um, some wrens are protected, right? Can you protect wrens from other birds? Like, what, what, is, uh, <laughs> what can you do? Yeah. So yeah, the legal status there. The wrens. The wrens are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act because they're native native US birds. Um, the house sparrow, which is the species that's uh, 
that nests in boxes and takes over like that, House Sparrow is uh, introduced from Europe. Um, so it's technically not protected under US law. Um, that's my understanding. Um, but, um, you know, it's often, I, I live out in the countryside where we don't have house sparrows, but it's the wrens here that are the aggressive species that take over the birdhouses. Um, and um, uh, so one, one solution for that is to put up more birdhouses. Um, the, it's the house that's the scarce resource and the birds are fighting over that resource. So um, if you put up enough houses, there will be more, more room. The wrens can have their own apartment and the sparrows will have their apartment and uh, they'll, they'll live more, more uh, peacefully side by side um, as long as there's enough uh, house space for all of them. Um, and uh, there's a trick, um, a trick that I learned about it a few years ago for keeping house sparrows off of bird feeders uh, is to hang um, some strands of monofilament fishing line from the bird feeder. And apparently house sparrows are really scared of this. So just these loose strands of monofilament hanging from the bird feeder, um, I guess it, it f moves around, it flutters as the, as the sparrows um, fly in and they're, they're fanning the air, uh, moving air as they come in for a landing, it moves those strands of monofilament and for some reason that scares house sparrows and it doesn't bother other species. So um, that's a trick for uh, keeping house sparrows off of feeders and I've, I've heard that it works. I've never had a chance to try it but personally, but I've heard that that works. So uh, a question here, and uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, oh no, I didn't lose the name. Uh, this is from uh, from from Jennifer. Uh, something I'm wondering as well, and that's where do birds go when they fledge? Uh, I'm sorry, Jeanette. Uh, Jeanette says they seem to leave uh, birdhouses behind. I've I've seen with mm -hmm. birds that uh, are nesting close to our house as well. Like it seems like they they'll fledge, and then a day later they all take off, and then we'll see them much later when they're all ad adults. Yeah, yeah. It's a really interesting time for those birds and that's what's happening right now all around us but um, yeah as soon as the young birds can leave the nest as soon as they can fly just a little bit they they do they they leave the nest they scatter into the surrounding uh, shrubbery um, and that it's a little bit safer to so you don't have all the eggs in one basket anymore <laughs> so if a predator finds the nest it you know, it won't get all the young. Uh, so they scatter and they, they're still calling. They're, they're calling incessantly. Um, so the adults know where they are and the adults bring food to them. It also allows the young birds then to follow their parents. If the parents are finding a really good source of food a hundred yards away from the nest, the young birds will gradually move in that direction, um, seeing that that's where the parents are coming from. So it's the, the parents are making shorter trips to deliver food and, and the young birds also get to see then where the food is coming from. And, and as they get older and more mobile, they'll fly along right behind the parent and still saying, feed me, feed me, <laughs> but flying right along with it and watching while the parent gets food and puts it into their mouth. Um, so it's a big, a big learning experience. And, and it's just as the young birds get more more mobile um, and are able to follow the parents, they, they disperse. And then after, so they're probably still dependent on the parents for days or maybe a week after they leave the nest, then they really become independent. And, um, and then it's interesting where some species just sort of disperse into the woods. Some, it depends on their preferred habitat. Some disappear into the forest, some into, marshes, wetlands, weedy fields, hedgerows, but they're, they're out there just sort of quietly learning the ropes and finding their own food and figuring things out. And they'll start to gather in, in flocks, some species like chipping sparrows that 
you'll start to see big flocks gathering in another couple of weeks. So all the, you know, the chipping sparrows that nested in your yard and fledged in your yard might end up miles away in an open field somewhere with a hundred other chipping sparrows before they migrate south for the winter. We have a, a few questions about uh, starting out on, on, on birding. I'm going to kind of wrap these together that we can, we can uh, get in. Uh, Carol is, is, is asking about uh, if you'd recommend a particular set of binoculars for sort of mid-range watching. Also, uh, Skylar is asking about uh, educational literature that you would uh, recommend for starting out. And I also saw a question about the age for getting young people into birding and, and turning them onto binoculars and, and the, whole, the whole game. Hmm. Um, yeah, those are great questions. Um, I, so my binocular recommendation is to stick with lower power, seven or eight power, and um, get the best binoculars that you can afford. Um, and there's some really good, you can get really good binoculars now for just a couple hundred dollars. Um, I don't keep up with the, the brands, sort of the leading brands, but um, it's always a good idea to to try them out before you buy them. Um, and there are places, um, Mass Audubon has a shop at, at Drumlin Farm in Lincoln, another shop, um, I think they have a shop at, at Joppa Flats in Newburyport. There's a few other, and there's a, a number of independent bird related stores around that sell binoculars. So wherever you are, you're probably not too far from a place where you can actually try them out and get recommendations there and they'll have a better specific recommendation. But I would stick with the lower power. Don't be, uh, <laughs> don't be seduced by the idea of 12 power or 15 power. It's not gonna help that much and it's much more difficult to use. So stick with seven or eight power um, and you'll be happy with that. Um, and you know, I started birding as a kid. My father's an ornithologist, so it was kind of natural. But when I think back on it, it was just, we, were, we just went outside. We went on hikes on the weekend. Um, I was always out in the yard looking at bugs and flowers and worms and bringing things in and saying, look at this. And, and that was always encouraged. And, and we tried to identify things. And it was just a sort of nature study um, and gradually I got more and more focused on birds um, but I it's never too young to introduce kids in that way and binoculars I think uh, you know I started using binoculars a lot when I was seven um, and uh, I think kids are Kids are they're sponges and just learn so quickly and pick things up so easily that um, starting, you know, you can start as early as as um, as you want, um, introducing them to those kinds of things. Um, but it's um, when I think back to my early times in the field, it was it was really just about going outside and and seeing whatever came along and the, the focus on birds really uh, came later. Um, and for, for books, I, I know uh, you have a book, isn't it The Guide to Birding Basics? Is that the name of it? Yeah, it's called Birding Basics. And that's, um, it's not so much a beginner's guide, it's a, or it's a good introduction for very motivated beginners. It's really- um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty the, detailed. Yeah. It's pretty detailed. It's the, um, it's essentially, an expanded introduction of the field guide. It's all the material that I, I wanted to put into the introduction of my bird guide um, and um, it would have made the book too big. So <laughs> I made it a separate book. Um, there, um, uh, you know, resources for beginning birding. Th th this almost, uh, you know, I'm not trying to like sell it yes. to the top, so I'll the right way up, but. <laughs> This is kind of a good one to start with. I mean, when I was reading it through uh, for the first time, because it, it really goes, starts very basic and, and kind of, I don't know, it seems to go through everything methodically. Like I, this would yeah. be a great book for, for a young reader. I, I think. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, and that I, I will say that the, the concept of that book actually started 20 years ago as a, a bird book for kids. 
Um, and I wanted it to be more than a, a guide to identification to introduce people to all the amazing things that birds are doing. So then the book, the book kind of evolved over the years and uh, turned into this, but it's still, I still really wanted it to be kid friendly. So it's, it's, um, uh, it introduces all of the most familiar species and, um, uh, and gives you their names. Um, it doesn't talk about how to distinguish one from the other, but it'll tell you a lot about what the birds are doing and what, what makes each, each type, each group unique. So um, yeah, I think that, I think it probably is a, a pretty good uh, introduction to birds. Um, try to get uh, uh, some, some more questions in before we, we have to go. So a few people have been asking about hummingbirds uh, specifically. Um, one specific one is, is, does the advice on feeders, is that also the case for hummingbird feeders? Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that, if, that's, if hummingbird feeders are included in those recommendations. I haven't seen hummingbirds mentioned specifically, and I know that when I saw the, the lists of species that were affected by this, um, uh, this condition, it was, um, they said mostly um, birds like grackles, robins, starlings, um, the sort of medium-sized backyard birds, um, and then a long list of other, other species, wrens, sparrows, um, all of that, but hummingbirds were never mentioned, so um, I would look to uh, look to your state for a clarification of that. But as far as I know, hummingbirds are not included in that, the recommendations. And the uh, other and questions, sorry, we're, we're about um, if, if we are seeing uh, their numbers or migration affected. A, a couple of people mentioned that they're, they don't see like, feel like they're seeing them uh, this, this summer. Oh, humming, not so many hummingbirds. Well, that it's been so wet in Southern New England this summer. Um, the plant growth is um, really uh, <laughs> uh, lush, and there's probably a lot of flowers. I know that whenever I've had hummingbird feeders, the, the hummingbirds disappear when, when some of their favorite flowers are blooming, like honeysuckle. You can tell that two weeks that honeysuckle is blooming, hummingbirds don't really come to the feeders as much. So it, it's possible that there's just so much natural food out there this summer that the hummingbirds don't need to visit the feeders. Um, Interesting. That, 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 that's a nice, uh, hoping that that's the case, that, yeah. uh, you know, sugar water just doesn't taste as good as real honeysuckle. <laughs> no, and it's, yeah, it's risky and it's always, you know, it's the big show, it's the big, uh, it's like going to the mall sort of. <laughs> Well, David, this has just uh, just flown uh, by. Sorry. Well, yeah, I won't, I won't apologize <laughs> for that for the pun. Um, uh, what what a treat uh, speaking with you and uh, for all. Of, I'm I'm sorry we, we couldn't. Obviously, we couldn't get to all of all of our questions. We we had around yeah. 120 questions. Uh, we we did get to uh, some in some detail. Thank you everybody for uh, for for joining us. Um, and. Uh, yeah, we, we look forward to uh, you'll be joining us again, right? Yeah, yeah, we're planning planning a couple more of these. Yeah, looking forward to it. Well, thank you again, and and thanks uh, everybody who, who was able to join us. Uh, sign up for for the next one. We will uh, we'll be here, and um, yeah, I'm gonna go and uh, take down my uh, my feeders. Mm, thank you. Thanks, Arun. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe and keep birding.